Assalamu alaikum, I'm Carl Arundel and you're watching In Focus. And I'm delighted to be today joined by Anne-Marie Hutchinson, OBE, a senior partner at Dawson Cornwall Solicitors here in London, at the, whose offices I'm delighted to be sitting as we speak. Um, now, Anne-Marie Hutchinson is a pioneer in the uh, field of domestic family law and has been hailed as having rescued hundreds of women and girls, sometimes as young as nine, from violent forced marriages and uh, the risk of so-called honour killings uh, in countries, uh, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, mostly. She also advises women sometimes in the Middle East and uh, is one of just a limited number of specialists working in this highly complex area, which often involves her securing international court orders, restraining abusive partners from pursuing their victims. Now, Ms Hutchinson was nominated for the OBE by, of all people, the head of the UK Foreign Office Forced Marriage Unit, um, and she received that OBE in 2002. Um, she's also the chair of the UK uh, branch of the charity Reunite International, the Child Abduction Centre, which is recognised as the leading UK charity specialising in international parental child abduction and the movement of children across international borders. She was awarded the inaugural UNICEF Child Rights Lawyer Award in 1999. And in 2010, she received the International Bar Association's Outstanding International Women's Lawyer Award. Anne-Marie Hutchinson, Salam alaikum, and welcome to Islam Thank Channel. You. Thank you. Now, your charity Reunite estimates that over a thousand British Asian girls a year are forced into marriage against their will. What percentage of that, these cases, become the subject of legal challenge? And how many victims are you, uh, or other practitioners like you, actually able to help? Well, if I can, the, the figure of 1,000 um, is a figure that comes from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office through their forced marriage unit. There are a number of charities across the UK and internationally that deal with these issues. Um, Reunite touches upon it where it is a child under 18 with older young people. It may be the Henna Foundation, um, Karma Nirvana, and any number of charities that exist in England to deal specifically with the issue of forced marriage, honour-based violence, and issues that surround young people um, who find difficulties at some stage in their life of living within their family and living up to their family's expectations. And it's not all girls then? It's certainly not all girls. Um, many, many people who approach the Foreign and Commonwealth Office for assistance are young men. They may do that before the marriage has occurred, they may do it afterwards. When they've entered into what they see as a very unhappy marriage, they will then explain that they did so because they came under pressure, they felt they should, they felt obliged to fulfil their parents' wishes for them and to go along with an arrangement that they really didn't want. Um, so it's not only girls um, and boys and even men and older men and the range of ages can be anything from um, nine years is the youngest I know of up to, I've dealt with a, a, a lady, and she was 45, she was a widow, and her family wished her to marry again. She'd gone back into education, she didn't wish to marry again, she wished to move forward with her life, with her children as a widow, and she was forced to marry against her wishes. I find that a little bit difficult. I can quite understand a junior person, somebody I, under 18, uh, being forced, but somebody aged 45, how does that work? Well, let's look at the word force. Um, it's, it's a word that implies in many people's minds physical force, but it's not. It can be, it can be physical, and often is physical, but it can be duress, it can be emotional pressure. And sometimes it is inculcated in a person, it's feelings of guilt. They're aware, they, the arrangements have been made, the wider family know, the community know, and if they back out of that arrangement, everybody will know and the spotlight will n not only be on them, but it will be on their family. So they're almost pressurising themselves to go through with it because it's a whole factual nexus and it's not just their wishes and maybe not even their immediate family wishes that are involved. So it's a wide spectrum of factual issues that are going on. But it must be a nightmare to deal with, in legal terms, that sort of a process uh, which you've just described. 
Well, the definition of what is a forced marriage in legal terms is very clear. And as I say, it can be emotional pressure, it can be physical pressure. But in legal terms, what is very, very difficult is that the people involved in this situation, we're not dealing with contract law, we're not dealing with crime, we're not actually dealing with black and white areas of law. There are grey areas, there are times when the victim themselves may be making excuses for their family, may be wishing above all else that this isn't true, that their family want them to be happy and their family would not do it to them. So evidentially, sometimes it's very hard to pinpoint where exactly the force is, where the duress is, and sometimes throughout the process, it's very difficult to sustain in the victim a consistent position because they veer from, yes, please help me, get me out of here, I need to, to, you know, within a few weeks saying, well, I've spoken now to my uncle or my gran or somebody, and now I understand my parents' position, so I'm okay. And then moving back to when it comes to closer to the day itself, no, 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 no. I need to, you know, I need rescuing. I, I need some assistance to move on. So it's not an easy area of the law that's, that, to deal with, and it requires sensitivity, not only to the victim, but to, to all of the people who are involved. Now, in May 1999, a High Court judge, Judge uh, Justice Singer, was forced to use, I think, what was later described as a bogus court order to prevent a London Asian girl from being married against her will. Now, he intervened in the case, which caused a bit of a media sensation at the time, of an unnamed 17-year-old Sikh girl before ruling that her parents were guilty of child abduction. Uh, following the girl's return, Mr Justice Singer said, child is abduction is still child abduction when both parents are the abductors, and the child is very nearly an ad adult. Now, was this, in your opinion, a landmark case, and why? Well, I have to admit, I represented that young person and her sister. It, it was, but what was important about that case was it was the start of the public awareness in the UK of issues relating to forced marriage and honour-based violence. They were not publicly recognised, certainly in the mainstream. And up until that point in time, social services, the police, um, other agencies would very much see it as a domestic so a young person would turn up at their local authority, say, please help me, I need social help, work help, I need housing, and be told, well, no, no, you just seem to have had a, an argument with your parents, there seems to be a difference there, but it's not an issue we can help you with. So what KR said was, where you have a child whose fundamental human rights are being abused, the fact that the abusers are her parents makes it an abuse nonetheless. And that's what that said, in effect. Now, I understand that dealing with abduction cases in which a child is taken abroad, which is the core uh, work which you're involved in, is easier when there exists a reciprocal agreement between Britain and the country uh, of the abduction to arrange for the return of that child. Uh, what are the issues involved when a child is abducted to a country outside of those arrangements? Countries such as Algeria, for example. Are you ever party to covert rescue missions? Um, not covert, but I mean, two things with forced marriage cases, and because the in the UK the position tends to be that the young person is a British national living here, um, and they are taken overseas to marry a foreign national, with the intention that their spouse will join them um, in the UK in due course. Now, where that is the position, once the young person is overseas. There are no reciprocal arrangements that specifically relate to forced marriage. But, but where you are dealing with Commonwealth countries, such as India, Pakistan or Bangladesh, and some of the African countries, then there is an understanding. Our legal systems are actually very similar. They're based on the common law, and our judges understand what their judges understand. And so there is what we call judicial comity, if, even if there's not reciprocity. Where you have countries such as Algeria, Morocco, I've got two cases at the moment in Libya, um, Sudan, there are then great difficulties because our whole legal systems are fundamentally different. Um, some of those countries adhere only to the Sharia. There is no civil law system or no civil code. So there are grave difficulties um, in dealing with young people in those countries. Now, whilst it seems that the bulk of your cases are focused in Pakistan, Bangladesh and India, 
Uh, you do occasionally, as you've mentioned, get involved in cases in the Middle East, uh, parts of Africa you've just mentioned. Uh, now, one of the cases which received some, would argue, somewhat challenging publicity uh, was the case of a 17-year-old Edirin Onajeta Idugan. Uh, I must have mispronounced his name, but you'll forgive me, I hope, um, who it was alleged was abducted by his parents to Nigeria. The parents argued that, contrary to media reports, they were not intending to kidnap their son and marry him off to a stranger, but instead were rescuing him from the bad company of drag drug dealers and criminals into which he had fallen here in the UK under the uh, care of his aunt. Now, they accused the legal process, which used the new forced marriage protection order, uh, against them as a form of judicial terrorism, they said. Is there a danger that new laws may in some circumstances be uh, misused? I don't... In my view, no. But one has to look at cases such as Adirin's. And at the end of the day, although he, technically he was a child, under 18, but over 16, and children and young people have human rights. And we live in a society now where we recognise their human rights. And in other situations, we would expect their human rights to be upheld. So, for example, if that young person was excluded from school on an unfair basis, we would expect his rights to be upheld. And the fundamental basis of the Forced Marriage Civil Protection Act, whether it's adults or children, is this. You cannot, you cannot force somebody to enter into a lifelong commitment against their will. And equally, you cannot remove a person from the country that they live in, where everything that they have is, they may have been educated here, their job's here, their college is here, remove them and say to them, because we are in a position of power to do so, we're now removing you from the UK and you will now live in the Sudan, Nigeria, or wherever it is. Now there's a breach of that young person's rights and the government and the law says they will, they will assist young people in that situation. The fact they're outside of the country is irrelevant is irrelevant, and had that young boy been in the country, the court would have ex acted in exactly the same way. You are talking about the young person's basic human rights and the need to uphold those regardless of other, essentially other conventions. I mean, there are conventions which make ensure that somebody who is a parent has guardianship on a child up until the age of 18. Isn't there a, a little bit of a conflict here? there? There is always a conflict when you have rights because there are the, the rights of a parent, against the rights of a child. But in most legal systems, including the Sharia, we'll say a child's rights and the best interest of a child is paramount. And where you have conflict, one has to approach it with common sense, look at, look at the equality, look at the balance of power, and look at the balance of harm. And if a young person who, for example, will within three months be an adult is saying, I really would, would, do wish to go to university, not to marry at this stage or not to marry that particular person, or not to marry a person from that country. Um, that young person must be given a voice and you have to balance the rights between the rights of the parent and the rights of the child. It doesn't mean you override the parent's rights and the family rights and the cultural rights completely. You take them into the equation and do a balancing exercise. Now, traditionally, there was a, was a requirement for the victim to make themselves an application for either a non-molestation or an occupation order. Uh, I understand, I don't know if I'm totally correct on this, that things are quite different with the forced marriage protection order, that an application can be made by a wide range of parties. Is, is that correct? And what is the significance of that provision? When the Act was drafted, it was recognised, two things, one, that many young people um, be they adult or young people or, or children, find it very difficult to say, this is me and I am making a complaint against the people I love most in the world, my parents. Very, very difficult position for young people to be in. Secondly, they may be in a situation where you know, physically they cannot do that because they're overseas or there have been cases where they are, are in effect kept at home removed from school, their telephones removed, their access to the internet's removed, they're not allowed out of the house, they're chaperoned everywhere um, that they go with members of the family, so they physically cannot. So it was recognised you have to have a position where an interested party, not just any old busybody, but an interested party, be it a relative, a school teacher, a social worker, and in some cases a police officer, can make that application for them. And in effect, they're going to before the court and saying, I have a concern about this young person, 
this is who I am, am I interested in that young person? And these are the reasons I have a concern. And the court will then look into it and, and ask for further information to ascertain whether that young person requires assistance or whether that young person doesn't. So, just so that I'm clear on this, it, it suggests to me something a bit like a sort of social care order. If somebody suspects that uh, children are being abused uh, in a house, there are various provisions that allow, you say, interested parties uh, to uh, bring this to the attention of social care authorities and they have the authority and power to take action, which sometimes could be the removal of those children. Are you saying that something similar to that? Is well, it's slightly wider because in, in care proceedings, only the social services can take children into care. Um, with the forced marriage protection order, it's an interested person. So it could be a teacher, it could be, and often it is, a police officer, um, it could be a friend, it could be a sister, but they have to have some relationship and some interest in the girl, so it couldn't be a busy busy neighbour. Yes. I mean, that, that person would probably be told, we'll go and inform social services and let's see whether they will make the application, and they have an automatic right to, to make the application. I, I, I'm sort of thinking, as you're speaking, about the implications of such uh, a broad order, uh, that uh, whilst it clearly has been introduced for a very profoundly significant reasons to prevent the abuse of uh, the rights of young people, there would be scope, would there not, for uh, serious possible abuse uh, of those powers. And it's interesting that it is uh, literally a set of powers that is quite unique to this act, isn't it? Well, the powers are, are unique, but, but the court doesn't apply them without checks and balances and hearing the case. So if an unmeritorious case came before the court, and they do, and I will give you an example. Um, we came across a case where a young girl um, was overseas um, for the purposes of a marriage. A complaint was made by a unassociated, with the family, young man, who said he knew her from college and that he felt that she was overseas um, because she was being forced into marriage against her will. And a long, long story. Um, but when he was investigated by the court, because it has to be, it turned out that this young man, his affections were certainly unsolicited by this young, young lady. Um, he, there'd been complaints about him by her and her family. And the court, of course, said, no, you cannot. You, you, know, you, you are not allowed to. So the court is open and, and aware that there are potential abuses. And it, doesn't grant orders without looking at all of the evidence and all of the facts. Now, I, uh, we've discussed, uh, although it's not restricted to women, you do deal, probably the majority of your cases are, are with women. Is that, that's fair to say, is that? The majority are with, with, are with women. But it's important to know that the act relates not only to you know, the cases where it's either stopping, stopping the w wedding happening, whether it's in this country or abroad, or rescuing a young person sort of pretty swiftly after the marriage. There are many cases that come forward years later. Um, many, many, and especially young men tend to come forward two, three, four years after the marriage when it comes to the point in time when their spouse is going to join them or they're living within a very unhappy relationship. Um, and that's when they tend to come forward and say, well, it was a marriage I never wanted and I objected to, but these are the reasons I entered into it. Well, I understand that uh, somebody who is found guilty of abduction in, under this new protection order can face quite severe prison sentence uh, as, an, as an extreme case. Um, what are, just for the benefit of our viewers, what are the instruments available in terms of the, the, the legal process uh, to find against somebody who is involved in a process of abduction? The, the issue with the forced marriage civil protection is not only does it have a wide range of people who can make the complaint, it also has a wide range of people who can be the subject of an order. So, for example, if you have a family unit and the main perpetrators are mother and father, but there is an uncle who perhaps paid for the airline ticket, bought the jewellery, um, made the arrangements, hired the hall, he too could be and would be subject of a forced marriage civil protection order. A breach of an order can carry where there's been physical violence or a fear of physical violence, a power of arrest. So a power of arrest is attached and the police can automatically arrest somebody. As for, at the moment, at the moment, as for penalties, 
we do not have in this country a criminal law against forced marriage. We have a criminal laws against abuse, physical abuse, assault, etc. Or a breach. Um, but, or indeed a breach. But it's dealt with by contempt, by contempt of court. And in the case you mentioned earlier, the mother in that case certainly was committed to prison for her contempt of the court order by her failure to return her son to the UK, as she'd been ordered to do by the High Court. But so, so on what you just said, if somebody had been involved in an abduction, forced marriage, of which there are many, um, and it hadn't been reported, um, then they would not be breaking any law. Well, they probably would be because forced marriage is but one, usually one aspect of a whole series of events, many of which are criminal and illegal. So assault is illegal. Theft of a passport is a criminal offence. Holding somebody against their will um, is a criminal offence and can be trespass. So it would be very unusual for, to have a situation where no criminal offence had been um, committed within that course of conduct. What we have now, however, is a consultation as to whether or not we should criminalise forced marriage very specifically and have a very specific offence. Now, by your own definition, there are a range of different instruments that are being used uh, in, this, uh, in the case of forced marriages. Um, it, was there a desperate need for a forced marriages act in 2007? Weren't there existing uh, acts that could have dealt with all these cases? Before the Forced Marriage Civil Protection Act came in, there was a lot of con consultation and there were different views. Um, there were views from different NGOs who worked in charities in the area who felt very strongly that young people and victims wouldn't, would not come forward. There was the community, the wider community, some who felt um, that they were being marginalised, they were being picked on and fingers were being pointed at Pacific communities. And there were those in the middle who said, well, something should be done because once you raise public awareness, you, you deal with the issue better. Um, as a result, well, whether it's as a result or not, but what is clear is since the Act, which is a Civil Protection Act, came into being, the reporting of cases to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, office the Home Office, has increased. Now, whether that's because more cases are happening or whether it's because people are aware that they can now come forward is not known. I anticipate it's the latter. More young people know there's something that can be done. There's a label. It has a name. It's what's happening to me. I can make a complaint. Uh, you are sort of suggesting that the process of education perhaps is a meaningful mechanism to alleviate what is clearly a profoundly uh, abusive process at the moment. Uh, the law is on one side and you have mentioned that there is talk of uh, criminalising false marriage. Do you not think that perhaps uh, a process of community leaders, possibly schools and, and others, becoming involved in a process of education might also be of significance? In my view there are two areas on the education. I think education and public awareness are very important, the most important, the most important um, resource we have to deal with the problem. There are two areas. There's the mainstream public, the wider society, were unaware, were unaware of these issues, or if they were aware of them, it was, well, it doesn't happen to us. It happens to them, those people. It happens in those communities which are not our communities, which, which was not helpful. And then the communities themselves would be saying, well, it doesn't happen in our communities. You know, don't pick on us because we don't have that. We don't do that. And, of course, over the years, we have seen much more awareness happening, awareness programmes happening within the communities, but it's got to be grassroots. And the idea that that could happen within a matter, I would say, of one or two years is ridiculous. It's going to take a long period of time. You are dealing with the reasons behind these practices, which is so long held, that... One can't eradicate them immediately within two or three years, but pro slowly, slowly, younger people are coming up. They're becoming the parents of our gen new generations. And th hopefully, by then, the very idea of forcing a young person to marry against their will will be so ridiculous. It will be like you know, driving without a seatbelt, driving you know, 
under the influence of alcohol. It just will not happen. It wouldn't occur to people to so do it. So in the meantime, we need to have a robust uh, series of processes that will make sure that uh, these things don't occur. Well, what we have at the moment is civil protection, which is very important. The idea of criminalising forced marriage um, is very difficult. I personally, and as a practitioner, would not condone it. I do not support the idea of criminalising forced marriage. And I have a number of reasons for that. Um, but I personally don't, within that consultation, believe it should be criminalised. Now we've got to go to a break. We'll continue this enlightening conversation uh, in the second segment. Come work and join us. Thank you. Thank you.